Welcome to the Situation Report today. Glad to have you joining us. This is the show where we do our very best every single episode to give you the information and perspectives you need to navigate an ever-changing culture. My name is Jeremy Stolniker. Glad to be with you today. And our guest today is someone that got involved in the conversation around national politics and uh, really cultural change as a young man in college. Uh, I love the story because this is someone who, as a young person, said something needs to be done. I need to get behind uh, really the politicians, and in this case, the politician that I think can carry us forward. And I love hearing stories like that. I love understanding and being told and kind of having the opportunity to see that there are young people out there, as much as we like to throw rocks at people who are younger than us, young people out there who take the world seriously and take their responsibilities seriously. And uh, thankfully, we have the opportunity today to talk to someone who's been on the front line of this, again, since college and now beyond. My guest today is Ryan Fournier. My guest today is Ryan Fournier. Ryan is a political commentator, Republican strategist, and the founder of Students for Trump. Ryan, thanks for joining me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. A lot of people know you. You're very um, involved with uh, so many aspects of um, the political process and elections as a, the uh, founder of Students for Trump. Uh, a lot of folks, particularly in our circle, would know who you are. But for those who do not, <laughs> give us uh, give us some of your background and c- kind of how you got into this. It's a pretty interesting story. Yeah, no, I, I sort of as a mistake. Uh, uh, something that <laughs> like so many things. <laughs> I, yeah, no. Uh, when you're when you're in it for this long, you know, five years, it kind of takes a couple years off your life, it seems. But sure. no, it, it was something on accident, really. You know, I didn't anticipate that I would, you know, come to this level to where I'm defending sort of family values, things that yeah. are kind of common sense on a national level. But I started uh, Students for Trump in 2015, I believe. It was in my dorm room. I was a first uh, first semester. Uh, first year freshman at Campbell University. And I saw, you know, Donald Trump come down the golden escalator like a month or two prior to being there. And I just thought to myself, I was like, man, this guy, you know, he's like a golden ticket to the White House. He's not like a Romney. He's not like a McCain, Mm -hmm. even though he was white, he was wealthy. He knew how to connect with a base of people who felt like their voice had been just lost in the mainstream media, you know, sort of a rumble. Uh, and this guy was able to get out there and articulate points, talk about things people actually cared about. And I was like, yeah. man, you know, I want to help him. What can I yeah. do? And so yeah. I looked to see if there was a youth group or anything of that nature. And there wasn't. So I, you know, just boldly decided I'm going to start a Twitter account. It was at the time called uh, student for Trump. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was just me <laughs> tweeting out. Uh, You know, things about, yeah, it's crazy. Things about Donald Trump, you know, when he was debating, you know, in the uh, early or late 2015, you know, Drudge had him polling pretty high in the debates. We were sharing this stuff. We were writing positive things about him and uh, campaign reached out. They said they love what we're doing and build it up, keep doing more. And so we we did that. We went to other platforms. We built a volunteer student movement. uh, And fast forward 2019, we did a a merge, sort of a partnership with Turning Point Action uh, to really make it this multi-million dollar effort uh, to to get the youth vote out on the college campus. Because we all know, you know, Democrats use the college campus as sort of like a roadmap uh, to the White House with all these carrot stick approach ideas they have that never work out. But no, it's 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 been a blessing. I'm humbled. Uh, a lot of mistakes made along the way, a lot of blessings, uh, met a lot of people. But, you know, at the end of the day, I wouldn't change it for the world. We're out here changing lives, uh, advocating for things that help people. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm proud to be in it. What is your your background like from your home? How do you get to the place where you're in college and you go, you know what, I want to support a Donald Trump. I believe this is important and I'm going to do what I can. Were you, well, you, know, were you I, raised I, that way? Was that something you fell into or, or how did you come to that place? Yeah. So it's my family really isn't political. Um, in a way, they are. They are Republican. They're conservative, but none of them have held public office. None of them have ever wanted to hold public office. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's like kind of kitchen table conversations, uh, you know, that we've had over the years about, you know, Bush and, you know, all these, uh, you know, Obama was really, yeah. you know, president yeah. that I think fired up so many Americans, fired up yeah. my family. Um, but yeah, my family definitely instilled conservative values on my own, but I did my own research and I encourage every young person to do their own research. So you're not just kind of, you know, uh, lifting off the back of your family in a way, you know, 
believing everything that they say to you, you know, go out and do your own research. And, and that's what I did. And, and I came back around and was like, yep, I'm conservative. Uh, yeah, right. so <laughs> mom and yeah. dad were right. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah, no, no, they were. And, and when you get your first paycheck, when you go out in the real world and, you know, you look at that first paycheck and how much is being withheld in taxes, you're like sitting there like, okay, yeah. you know, maybe I am conservative, right? You know, taxes going up, you know, every single year under Democrats. Uh, but no, yeah. So that, I guess in summation is sort of uh, how everything formed. It was kind of, you know, quilted in over the years and uh, did my own research and came yeah. to the conclusion that, yeah, I am, I am uh, actually a conservative. So I was, uh, I was reading your bio uh, last week, I think, looking at, you know, some of your background. And I was thinking of my, my daughter, she's 23. She is a senior at Chapman University here in, uh, in Southern California. And uh, she's very involved with the um, Republican Club. They're on campus. And so we've had a lot of very interesting conversations, but raised in a conservative home, you know, similar to maybe your story, but had to come to that on her own. And she went to college and then she would come home and she's like, people here are crazy. Like, I can't believe the things people say. So she's gotten very involved. She's she's a, an accounting major, but she's writing for the paper. She wrote an article about uh, Joe Biden the other day. And I'm you know proud of her involvement. But I was asking her, like, what's the tone on campus? It's a it's a relatively conservative area. It's Orange County. What's the tone on campus with with uh, the students there? And she said, well, the Republican Club is standing room only most of the time. They meet at 10 o'clock on Monday nights, so it's not convenient. And the the Democrats have a, par, a, a, a group on campus as well. And she said typically three or four people will show up, and that's it. So that seems to be the tone. That's a unique situation perhaps, but what right. is your perspective? Do you feel like young people are starting to get more involved, less involved, that there is a shift happening? How do you see that from where you sit? Well, you know, it, it's kind of changed over the years uh, in some ways for the worse. I, I think the political violence, uh, especially mm -hmm. the, you know, the tone after J6 towards conservatives yep. Yep. has forced certain people into a corner, especially at places like, you know, where the you know, the, the uh, free speech movement uh, campus, UC Berkeley. Yeah, right, uh, right. I, most people wouldn't even dare to come out and, you know, give a speech and say, I'm conservative for this, that, or the third without yeah. thinking they're going to get, you know, attacked or get a tomato thrown at them in the face, even worse <laughs> than that. Um, but th that's kind of where it's shifted. I, I think when Trump was in office, you had a pretty good amount of vocal conservatives standing up for his ideas and his principles on the college campus. Uh, I don't know if that's really fully the case right now, because I think a lot of people are scared and concerned. Um, I just visited NC State a couple of weeks ago. Now they have yeah. a pretty mixed population. They have a really booming college Republicans there, a young Republicans, a turning point group. Uh, engagement is 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 through the roof that, uh, at that university. Campbell University, same thing where I went to school and alumni hear the same thing from ECU in North Carolina. Uh, it, it seems like a lot more people are trying to get involved, especially with midterms coming up. Uh, yeah. So there is energy out there. There definitely is energy. People are going out registering voters. We're doing it with students for Trump. We're going on the college campuses. We've got campus tours. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm. There's a lot of energy. But there's also a significant amount of people who are kind of scared to come out, which is unfortunate. It shouldn't be like that in this yeah. country where, you know, just because you support a different ideology or a different viewpoint, now all of a sudden you have a target on your back. Uh, just the similar situation that just happened with that 18 year old, Kaylor uh, right. Ellingson, right. Uh, where he was run down and yep. killed by a maniac because right. he supported Donald J. Trump. And this guy thought he was an extremist because of that. And that's nothing more because of the rhetoric of the current resident of the United States who goes out on a national stage, desecrates the birthplace of our freedom as we know it, and basically calls uh, has a call to violence against all conservatives across the country. Uh, you know, what do you expect? So there's a lot of people that are sort of on the edge now uh, as to whether they should be vocal or whether they should just, you know, go to the polls. Uh, now, I'm one of those people that would say you be vocal. Go out, help register voters, be right. loud, be proud, right. uh, because that's the only way we're going to win this. What could uh, the Republican Party do better that they're not doing right now to bring young voters, young people along? Yeah, you know, this has been this has been such a, an ear for me um, over the years, you know, dealing with certain groups, you know, college Republicans on the national level. I think they're bankrupt. I, I think that mm -hmm. they are in debt. I don't think they have money. <laughs> yeah. Um, the GOP itself, to be honest with you, has done a horrible job at getting young people engaged. It's been groups like Turning Point. It's yeah. been groups like uh, Students for Trump. 
Uh, there's certain other little sort of groups that have been created off of that that have done the work. It, it, it's influencers on social media, DC Drano, myself, yeah. uh, Jack Posobiec that are engaging with the young audiences. Uh, it's part of the meme culture. Many Johnson, too. They're doing much more than the GOP has done in the last 10 years to get young people. So I don't know if the solution is going to come from the party because yeah. it hasn't. I've seen like five youth directors over the last three or four years at the GOP, and they've all left or they've been fired and they have a consensus. They can't change anything because the GOP is not willing to change. Do you think that is, a re- is that a consequence of technology and the media landscape has changed and they're just trying to do it the way they've always done it? Or, or is it or is it more than that? It, that's part of it. That's part of it. I think you have the old guard there. You have to, you know, think about who's running, you know, the GOP. It's yeah. the Romney, you know, Romney yeah. McDaniel, uh, who I also am in yeah. favor of, you know, having her removed as the chairwoman. Um, I think we need someone more in tune with this movement and what's going on, especially with culture and the way technology is changing. They're just really not up to bat on that. Now, they do have yeah. a great data game. They're great at all these other things. I just think that they see the youth part as, OK, these other groups are kind of handling it. Now we don't have to. Mm. But uh, they weren't doing a great job with it at any point. And I, I think it's because maybe they think it's lost. They, they believe that they can't get the youth vote, uh, w- which is a bunch of baloney to me because there are so many young people out there. Uh, who look to the right, who look to conservative values and principles and just love them. They love the guy who's out there touting them, Donald Trump. So, I mean, it's just a matter of the messaging and having the right people do it. It's not going to be a 50 or 60 year old going on a college campus, giving a speech uh, about tax reform. That is not going to get young people to want to vote Republican. What's crazy about this to me in particular is you look at a guy like Bernie Sanders, who um, on on the left had the youth vote, right? Like, He's an old man. <laughs> he yeah. kind of mumbles to himself, but he has the message that connects with you know young people. And why the Republican Party can't see that and understand that it just it boggles my mind. It's just it's crazy because it is possible, but they've just dismissed it as you said. Um, yeah, crazy. We come to the midterms, um, and hopefully the Republicans will do better. There seemed to have been a moment a few months ago where it was just, we're waiting for the red wave to happen. We're just waiting for it. It's just a matter of time. Um, It's going to be overwhelming. As we've gotten closer, some of these races have tightened up, and Mm -hmm. maybe it's not going to be quite the red wave that everyone had anticipated. I don't know that. It's a feeling. Maybe it's just a feeling. Um, where are we as it relates to the midterms with uh, really a month or so to go? Before we jump into that, though, um, I would imagine if you've been to the grocery store recently, you've noticed that things are more expensive. Gas is more expensive. It doesn't matter where you live in this country. Things are more expensive. The economy, our economic future is uncertain. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it that we can do to protect our financial future for our families, for our children? What can we do personally? Uh, One of the things I would recommend is at least considering uh, adding gold and silver into your IRA, your investment accounts. Take a look, figure out how to do that, and see if that is the right fit for you. The place that you can start is with Lear Capital. Call Lear Capital, and you can get their free precious metals investor guide. You can also ask them about their Lear Advantage IRA that lets you transfer or roll over your old 401k or IRA into a gold and silver tax advantage IRA. Plus, Lear is offering right now crazy shipping, uh, free shipping, and up to $15,000 in bonus gold or silver with a qualified purchase. This is something you at least need (laughs) to take a look at. You can call for details, 800-489-6450. Lear Capital is the most rated precious metals company on consumer affairs with a near-perfect rating on Trustpilot. Call them at 800-489-6450. That is 800-489-6450. Calling that number, you will get your free kit. And there you will learn how gold has performed during periods of inflation, government debt, interest rate hikes, economic crashes, even wars, and how in all of those gold has been the financial bedrock asset in portfolios. Uh, One of the things I love about Lear Capital is that they are an American-owned company, proud to do business with Americans that share 
conservative values. Write this number down, 800-489-6450. Call them today, or if you don't want to call, you can click the link below in the show description and the show notes. Check them out. You will do yourself a great service by at least investigating Lear and what they have to offer. Well, you know, Jen Psaki said the other day, if these uh, midterms are a referendum on Joe Biden's presidency, we're going to lose. And, you know, she's 100 percent right. When you look at uh, what's going on from the 13 heroes lost last year in Afghanistan to the crippling inflation, the temporarily uh, lowered gas prices, which are going to absolutely skyrocket after our strategic oil reserves are just completely depleted. They're at near historic lows now. So, I mean, after Christmas, just wait six, seven, eight dollar gas that is coming your way. Um, it should be a referendum on him. Uh, most of the people running, you know, if you looked at this Democrat candidates, they don't even want him to come out and campaign for him. Yeah. Right. They, they know how politically yeah. toxic this guy is to them even having a chance to getting into Congress. Notwithstanding, you know, the fact that everything else is in total dumpster fire. You know, when you look at midterms, <laughs> traditionally, it goes to the you know opposite party of who's in the White House. Right. Sometimes if you're a good president, you're succinct with Congress. The losses aren't that great. This guy is a walking liability. Right. This, <laughs> we are living right. in a dumpster fire. So if there are not historic losses uh, at levels we've never seen before, that some people are going to be, you know, questioning things. Um, when you look at also on the same ha- uh, same hand here is the polls. Uh, a lot of conservatives are kind of being weathered by the polls. They're like, oh, it doesn't look like we're doing so good, uh, you know, in PA or North Carolina. But yep. they're looking at sort of these national polls that are paid for by these opposing yep. campaigns. Um, don't pay attention to them. Don't be, you know, sort of weathered by those polls. Look at the battleground polls. Look at the polls that actually matter. You know, if you look at uh, I just saw one the other day, it was um 538, and it said Republicans hold a 21-point lead in battleground house districts uh, on average, 21-point lead. When you look at the top four issues, Republicans are leading by double digits on who should be the one to handle those. That's economy, uh, that is education, and the other one was crime, right? I think the fourth one was health care going into the abortion issue. So these are really big kitchen table issues that matter to voters. I mean, it's not like – People care necessarily about, uh, you know, what's going on in Ukraine at their dinner table. They're talking about crime, right? Is it safe to go to the grocery store? Are there groceries on the shelf? Can you afford to even drive an hour to work if you live far off, you know, somewhere in a rural area and you got to drive to the city? Um, These are things people actually care about and they're being affected by it. You know, economy, inflation. Crime. I mean, these things are just rampant right now, and it's affecting every single, uh, you know, everyday average voter. When you look at PA, it's now a toss up. The Senate race is a toss up. When you look at the the polling for North Carolina, Ted Budd, Cherry Beasley, he's up in those polls. Carrie Lake tied with uh, with Hobbs. There's a lot of potential here. We could flip PA. We can win Arizona governorship. We could keep North Carolina red. Um, but also on another hand, too, it's not going to happen. If people aren't just getting, you know, going on social media and and ranting about this stuff, we actually need to get people out there, energize, mobilize, get your friends to the polls, help these candidates out uh, because they need it. Door knocking, whatever you can do, because that's the only way that we're going to win this election is by showing up in uh, numbers that have never seen before and then duplicate that for 2024. Uh, You know, it really is ours to lose, quite frankly. Um, And one more thing I would add on that is that these guys are offering really no governing agenda. Really, it's it's sort of a rebuttal on Trump. Um, You look at the economy. They can't defend that. They they can't defend, you know, the border and how it's open borders and how the country is being, you know, flooded with illegal immigrants. There's really nothing for them to tout. There's no accomplishments for them to go off on for Biden. So really, I, I mean, they're just put in a corner with all of this. Uh, so it really is ours to lose. Who are you excited about right now that is running? I mean, there are a lot of young, younger people, people who are not right. certainly establishment that are running right now. Who are some of the people that you're looking to? You know, I love uh, Myra Flores in, in Texas. That was a historic uh, yeah. win uh, yeah. to get you yeah. know her in here. Uh, one other thing I want to add on top of all of it is, yeah. is when you look at our side, we are so diverse. You know, I know when you look at 2020 numbers, I think it was like 30 something percent of minority voters, historic levels in terms of who turned out and voted for Donald Trump. Absolutely historic. We got another guy here in North Carolina, Bo Hines, uh, young guy. 
uh, who is just phenomenal. I met him when he first started running. His uh, people reached out to me. We've been friends ever since. I think the guy's going to make a phenomenal congressman. Look at Florida. Ana Paulina Luna, another Hispanic candidate who's just really in tune with the issues. I've known her for a few years. She's an amazing lady. Uh, veteran as well. U.S. Air Force. Her husband is Special Forces. Uh, we just have a really great slate of candidates this yeah. time around. Uh, and so I think it's, you know, up to the voters, do everything you can get these guys elected because we have a very diverse slate, not just of race, but of thought, you know, yeah. all of these folks come together on these issues. They may have, you know, different ways that they want to do it, but they come together. And, you know, I think that that's what makes it so great. So we have a lot, we have a lot of great candidates. Ryan, one of the things that I have been concerned about and continue to voice is that if there is this, you know, red wave, um, using air quotes over here, and we secure uh, the House, certainly, but the Senate, potentially, that Republicans will do what Republicans have always done, and which, which is not a lot. <laughs> so I guess part right. of one of the question would be, what, what can Republicans do if they get control? And number two, will they set themselves up for a win in 24? Or will that be baggage that whoever our candidate is in 24 will have to drag with them? Right. You know, we see this every time, every time the economy has some sort of great recession or depression. Uh, Republicans are the one who historically come in and clean up everything that's going on. Lower taxes. Right. Uh, you know, it, it's it just happens every time uh, if they get in there and they actually act on their promises. I do not want to see another 2017 Congress like it was under Paul Ryan, yeah. where we, uh, you know, flubbed health care. We screwed yeah. up the border, uh, made the cri made it even worse. Um, we were just lame ducks and that's why we lost. And it, I can imagine if we had that house and Senate for four years, Trump would have accomplished so much more. You know, you give him another four years, you give him a, a good Congress. We're going to accomplish things that, you know, at a level, uh, you know, never seen before. Sure. So they have to get in there. They've got to actually work on fixing the economy. They got to take credit for it. Uh, you know, this is not a Joe Biden fix. I don't want it to come right. out as, Oh, Joe Biden's <laughs> fixing right. the economy. Right. No, it's going to be Republicans fixing the economy, fixing inflation fixing crime, uh, go out there and fix these things. But also at the same time, Hunter Biden, go after the Biden crime family. I want you to go after them like we like they did to Donald Trump. Any chance that they got play the same game with these guys, because that's the only way you win is when you yeah. fight back. That's going to energize the party like nothing you've ever seen before. Uh, we just saw this stuff with Bob uh, Belinsky uh, that just came out here. Uh, yesterday with Tucker, where he's got documentations basically confirming that Hunter Biden's been laundering money between a Chinese company that he had 20 percent ownership in uh, to a U.S. company that he 100 percent owned. So these things have to be looked into 10 percent to the big guy. Uh, this relationship with China and Ukraine that they have going on, it, it seems to me the president is compromised and this yeah. stuff needs to be looked to. And the American people deserve answers, because if it's the case, that is much more of an impeachable offense than anything Donald Trump has ever done. Right. And, I, and I agree with all of that. But do you think it will happen? I guess is my question. Do you think the people that are coming in potentially that will be uh, elected and and will take back control have the necessary energy focus desire to to do that it's up to the base really you know if the base is energized on that issue and keeps pushing forth with that issue demanding that the represent you know representatives do it i think yep. it'll happen i've heard from a lot of these guys who are running that they plan to do it marjorie taylor green uh yep. matt gates uh jim jordan a lot of people that are going to be jumping on this board and all it takes is one committee it doesn't take all yep. the members so if we get just one committee on this issue that's investigating it using the, you know, working with the DOJ, if they you know, want to stop acting weaponized for one second of their lives uh, <laughs> right. to look into an actual issue here, um, yeah. then, then that'd be the case. But I think looking further on, even beyond that, 2024, um, got the FBI, got the DOJ. I mean, they're, 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 they're insolvent at this point. You can't yeah. fix them. It's top to bottom, all echelons of a weaponized system, criminal justice system uh, that is systemically going after conservatives while turning a blind eye against people that they see favorable. Hunter yeah. Biden, Joe Biden. You know, we just saw this with the FBI agent who was, you know, walked out of a building when it came out publicly uh, that he, you know, told agents to, you know, stay away from the Hunter Biden stuff. You know, even though he's yeah. got child porn and all this other yeah, stuff right, on his computer, right. we're not going to go after him. I mean, it's it's absolute load of BS that we're seeing this from the FBI. Right. They sure. trust us. Yep. Right. They're the guys who are saying trust us. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Man, we'll wait and see. Hopefully that is what will happen, and we certainly need that. Our country needs that. Um, another issue that you have been talking about, writing about, is the uh, the pipeline uh, mm-hmm. d- disaster. I guess we'll call it a disaster. Yeah. Um, I heard this morning that OPEC is um, considering uh, limiting supply even now in spite of everything that's happening in the world. And, you know, you can make the connection between Saudi Arabia and Russia or whatever. Um, gas prices are bad. Our policy, energy policy here in the United States is bad. Um, Europe is in a much worse situation than even we are with fewer options. And then you had this event take place. Talk to us about the Nord Stream pipeline, what took place there, what happened, and what it's all going to mean. Yeah, so uh, this, this is an interesting story. You know, I, I keep making this joke to myself, you know, did, did it Epstein <laughs> itself, right? right. Because <laughs> it's, somebody had to have blown this up. Yeah. It had to become from, you know, an industrialized nation with a pretty good Navy that had the capabilities to deep dive down there to plant tons of TNT, mm-hmm. underwater TNT, uh, to make this explosion. Uh, and this may be controversial for some people, but I have no doubt in my mind that this was an allied effort, if not even the United States. Uh, we're seeing now that there was radar of Black Hawk helicopters uh, sort of in the vicinity, hovering around the water uh, for a period a, a couple weeks ago. Uh, the U.S. Navy Sixth Fleet, I believe like a month or two ago, was conducting training exercises in this same area where this explosion went off. You have the U.S. government, Joe Biden, who's already said, you know, if they invade Ukraine, we're going to, you know, end the Nord Stream pipeline. The State Department saying the same thing. You got Anthony Blinken coming out the other day saying this creates you like a unique opportunity. You know, these aren't words from people who aren't involved in something like this. Sure. Uh, And I hate to be a person, you know, saying that, you know, about our own government, but it's not the first time that they've lied to us uh, conveniently enough. You know, look at Gulf of Tonkin uh, in Vietnam, which escalated the entire thing. That, that's what I compare it to. Uh, you know, this is just pure escalation. Um, but, w- you know, when you scrape at the surface of it all, I think in the beginning when this first happened, people were like thinking it was Russia. Right. When you scrape the surface and then you'd, you'd ask yourself, well, why would they do that? And yeah. then you'd come to this conclusion, well, to further destabilize the European economy. Uh, but why why would they blow up their own pipeline, which is like their cash cow? Forty yeah. percent of their revenues come from this pipeline. Why would they do that when they've already shut down Gazprom already shut down access to Germany? Right. You have to ask your question, who benefits the most from all of this? And it most certainly is not Russia, uh, you know, by destroying their own pipeline. Right. Uh, another piece to this that really sort of bothers me um, is that you have to ask yourself who benefits the most from this. Well, it's not Germany. Uh, because, you know, for number one, now it puts them in this corner where they can't, you know, sort of bend the knee since they're, I mean, they're going through some, you know, energy crisis like we've never seen before, where sure. their energy prices are thousands percent higher than they were. You're going from $5,000 a year costs on energy to $30,000 a year costs. It's bankrupting people there. There's riots in the street. There's protests. So it sort of gets them out of being able to bend the knee right. to Russia right. for, for peace talks in a way. That's one thing. The other thing, and I go back to Anthony Blinken's comment, I'm kind of creating a spider web with all of this, creates a great opportunity, something along the lines he said, well, why does it? Well, because the U.S. is the largest exporter of liquid um, natural gas, LNG, right? So now Germany has one option on their hand where now they can buy LNG uh, from the United States in mass uh, to keep their citizens from freezing to death. It's so it's so ridiculous uh, what's going on. We told them, you know, we've told Germany, you know, sure. if you don't become energy independent, right. you know, this this could happen. And it happened less than five years after it being said. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the Baltic pipeline, which was conveniently announced that it was operational like the same day or a day after or something like that. It was just like out, something out of a movie. Right. Um, th- there's just a lot going on here. You know, there's information that we're not privy to, and I don't know if we ever will be. Uh, but this was a direct escalation. And, you know, it, when you kind of look at this, you're like thinking, well, there's really no other way for Russia to respond to this than a large scale war against the United States of America. I mean, it, it's scary. It really is scary. And now we're talking, you know, where they, they mobilize one of their nuclear submarines uh, and, and no one can find it. Like the U.S., I think, scrambled satellites to be able to help track this thing. And I don't think they even found it yet. So that's concerning as well. You have I think it can launch like five or six uh, ICBMs from it that can create like a uh, what it was like a 
16,000 foot tsunami, the radioactive tsunami is what they were saying off the coastline of a, of a country. Uh, scary stuff, scary yep. stuff. People should be definitely tuning into this and watching it because it could get to something a lot worse. Uh, do you think that a lot of this with Russia and um, I mean, Russia's getting blamed for everything right now, but in part, they're getting blamed for it because Putin won't stop talking. <laughs> so that's a big reason right. they're getting blamed for a lot of it. Is this a uh, saber rattling on his part? Would he actually go through with, you know, whether it's nuclear or something else, escalation for sure? Um, or is this just him trying to leverage what he has, which right now is words, to right. get people to do what he wants them to do, get Ukraine to, to fold to him? Um, is it real or is it, is it just fear mongering? I, it could be a mix of both. But honestly, Putin looks like a dying man. Uh, I think he's trying to restore the greatness, uh, as he would call it, of the Soviet Union. I, I really think he's a dying man. I think he has an illness. I, th I think something's, you know, not really all right there uh, in Russia. Uh, and it's kind of concerning because a dying man is somebody who you really don't want to mess with, especially sure. one who has nuclear capabilities. Uh, so, I mean, it could go either way. I don't I would hope not. I don't know for certain. I don't think anybody really knows for certain what somebody like Vladimir Putin would do uh, at this stage in his life, especially considering the fact that, you know, if you have all these Russian troops wiped out, thousands of tanks destroyed, you've, you know, mobilizing your society uh, to fight. And if they don't, they'll be killed uh, or jailed. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you got to kind of think to yourself, you know, we don't really see this stuff happening all the time. This is like, you know, World War Two kind of, you know, combat type stuff you're seeing and in, in, in especially the way the government is acting. Um, I don't know. Um, and and I, I don't like to think about it, but I know for certain that if he was going to do it, maybe he would have already done it. Um, I think it's going to further escalate things. I do. I think it's probably going to force the U.S. to get directly involved in this. And that's the thing that I, I scare, you know, I'm scared of yeah. the most. I don't want to yeah. see U.S. citizens go overseas and die for Zelensky, you know, die fighting Putin. That's the last right. thing that I think any of us want to see. But the way that this administration is treating this issue and the way that NATO is treating this issue, um, it seems like that's what they want. You know, whether their goal long term is to kill Putin, to wipe out his regime, um, maybe that's their goal. I, I think I, I think it is. I don't know how they're going to go about that in the current circumstances yeah. we're in, unfortunately. But I'm sure. no expert. I'm no yeah, expert. There's... I'm kind of speculating on this. But it, it's a situation that everyone in, in this country should be watching because it could have a direct effect on your life uh, when you least expect it. There's an entire new economy being created right now filled with patriotic companies that have had enough of cancel culture and the left. One you can support every day and all you have to do is get dressed. I'm talking about undertack boxers. These have to be the greatest boxers ever made, probably because they have literally been tested by special forces operators. They're made with high quality material that's antimicrobial, anti-pilling, and moisture wicking. So you stay fresh and dry all day long. They come with a sturdy yet comfortable waistband that doesn't crack or loosen. Undertack is durable, ultra thin, and shrink resistant. Here's the best part. They're almost 30% less than the woke designer brands with the non-binary models. GetUndertack.com. That's GetUndertack.com. 20% off site-wide with the offer code, but only with the offer code SITREP20. SITREP20. Support a great American company that's pro-America, pro-Second Amendment, and pro-military. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. GetUndertack.com. That's GetUndertack.com. Offer code SITREP20. And the energy piece of this is really important. And as you mentioned, this right. does not benefit Russia, so it pushes Putin, who is desperate anyhow, to a different place of desperation, and he's going to have to do something. On the side of the United States, if this was indeed something either perpetrated by or um, instigated by the United States, uh, the the Nord Stream pipeline issue, the elimination of of energy, and uh, all of the things that you described, what is the end game for the United States? Where where is this taking us? And this is why it's so confusing to me as someone who pays attention to this. We look at what Putin is doing, what he's done. There's no question um, what he's done is not only illegal, it's immoral, it's unethical, it is destructive, it's it's wrong. There's no way to dismiss that. I would suggest that Zelensky has uh, been a part of the immorality and the brokenness of it, that he is right. in part uh, the reason that this is happening. So we can look at all of that, we can, we can put that together. But then what's the United States' game here? And particularly if we say, well, they went as far as to 
damage the the Nord Stream pipeline. What's the end game? What's tr- what are we trying to accomplish in all of this? Well, you know, I think it all comes back to the the new world order question, right? You know, the great reset here, especially when it comes to energy. Um, when it comes, you know, because one thing or the other, I mean, look at who's funding this war. You know, we have spent billions upon billions yeah. of dollars directly funding this right. war. Um, and who is, you know, the aggressor? Well, it's Vladimir Putin. What do I think is going to happen from all of it? I, I think the end goal here is to take out Putin. I think the end goal is to, to make them where they don't have such of a monopoly, uh, you know, on the, you know, the East when it comes to, you know, oil. Um, when it comes to those resources where, you know, they're basically all these countries are dependent on them. I just don't like the way that they're going about this. You know, I I think that it's very treacherous. Uh, You're getting in very muddy waters uh, when you start to act sort of as this arbitrator of the world where you're going up, you're destroying pipelines, uh, you're escalating conflicts that really we shouldn't be as involved in as as we are, in my opinion. Uh, But I, I don't really know fully you know, the full outcome of this. I, you know, I've kind of been picking apart the pieces and, you know, I come to different conclusions based on all these different things that I put together. Um, hopefully, whatever the include, uh, you know, the conclusion of uh, of this is, is hopefully it doesn't get us bombed, right? Hopefully right. we're not living right. in a nuclear shelter in two years. Um, you know, I think that that's what most people care about. Do I think it's going to get to that? No, I, I pray to God it doesn't. You know, you have a lot of people out there who like to make these, you know, assumptions and say, oh, sure. we're going to get into World War Three and all this down the third. Anything is possible, but I would hope there is a lot of fail stops in place to make sure right. that does not happen, because if that were it, cha- it changes the world as you know, it really becomes a true great nuclear reset. You know, I, I just saw an article the other day and you, you wouldn't believe this, where you had a media outlet saying, uh, would nu- would nuclear war help? Stop, stop or combat climate change. I kid you not. Will that's it combat climate sure. change? Yeah. Yeah, that's the big issue. That's what we need to worry about right now uh, with yeah. everything happening in the world. Well, it's funny. I, I'm in California and, you know, we hear about climate all of the time. And so with everything that's happening in our country and in the world, um, what our governor is concerned about <clears throat> is whether or not we'll be using electric vehicles in a few years. So we right. had, don't well, it's, it's a force of nature that they're trying to put on everybody now. Right. You know, that's another big piece to all of it is renewable, uh, renewable energy, you know, electricity, electric cars. And, and it's just so unrealistic, you know, right. California's power grid can't even, you know, Correct. Yep. you know, you know, you know, where I'm going with it. It yep. can't even sustain. So I, I don't really understand. And even Elon Musk here is saying that if you give up, on, you know, coal and fuel, uh, that'll be the end of the world as you know it, because it's not sustainable. You need to have those things as well uh, if you're also doing electricity. So crazy times to be alive. We'll see what happens. Um, certainly the midterms could be a step in the right direction in just about every one of these issues. Ryan, where can people uh, follow you and uh, stay in tune with what you are concerned about, what you're writing about and talking about? Yeah, so I'm on Truth Social, on Getter, Twitter, Facebook. You can just find me at Ryan A. Fournier. That's F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R. Look forward to it. Uh, it, it. I always like to tell people as well, if you ever have any questions or anything you want to discuss off show, you can always feel free to email me. It's info at RyanFournier.com. But yeah, awesome. no, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, well, thank you, Ryan. And uh, hopefully we can do it again. Yeah, would love to. Thank you again. Awesome. Many of our veterans feel they need to fight their battles alone. This self-isolation has led to the staggering statistic of more than 20 veterans taking their lives every day. The mission of Mighty Oaks is to eradicate the veteran suicide epidemic and help our warriors change their legacies. We've been able to help over 4,000 veterans and first responders by equipping them with the tools they need to live the lives they were created to live. Our faith-based, peer-to-peer approach has one of the highest success rates of any program available today, offering hope and understanding to those who need it most. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these men and women are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. It's your generosity that can make a difference in the lives of the men and women who have fought for our country and our freedoms. Now that they're home, don't let them fight alone. Learn more at MightyOaksPrograms.org. Appreciate Ryan's perspective. And uh, again, just the perspective of thoughtful people (laughs) is what I appreciate so much. Uh, We all have the opportunity to look at 
what's happening in the world very objectively to, based on evidence, draw conclusions, and yet so many fail to do that. We live in a culture that is getting its news from memes and from social media, and we need to be willing to take a harder look at what's happening, draw real conclusions, and do everything we can to use our voice to stand up and to put the right people in place to carry us forward. And Ryan is one of those that has done that and speaks so well on how the rest of us can do that. Appreciate his insights today. Uh, So much that you can do to support this show, but probably the most important thing you can do is subscribe. If you are not yet subscribed, please do that. That allows us to produce more content. You say, well, how does that happen? As our audience grows, and there are a lot of people who are listening who don't always subscribe, but as our audience grows, that gives us the opportunity then to have a larger audience that we can produce content for and opens up doors for us to do that. So we would love for you to subscribe, share this out with other people that you know that need to be a part of conversations like this. That would be fantastic. Go over to YouTube. You can find our channel there. Look for The Situation Report. You'll find so many great episodes as well as a large archive of episodes there that, uh, again, can be helpful to you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And we look forward to talking to you next time.